All right, I want to share the word this morning a little bit. Um, I want to share out of Judges chapter 13. Uh, and just so you know, I'm still uh, still really, really weak, and I'm just shaking, and not because I'm nervous about sharing the word, because I don't get nervous about that. Just trying to recover. So <clears throat> uh, your prayers, even under your breath during this, are greatly, greatly, greatly appreciated. Judges 13. This is about a man named Manoah and his wife. <clears throat> and... Uh, uh, maybe we'll just read some. I'll, I'll see how much we'll read. But we'll just start at verse 1. And uh, Manoah and his wife and the fire, <clears throat> ultimately. Judges 13, verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren, and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive, and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee. Notice, beware, I pray thee. And drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Verse 6, then, then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of a, an angel of God. Very terrible. Okay. I thought angels of God were pretty cool looking, but anyway. Very, very terrible. Um, but I asked him not whence he was, neither told he me his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O oh, my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again unto me and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that spakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Let not thy words come to pass. Uh, now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child? And how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said unto Moa, Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither of let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering... Thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that it was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name, that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor? The angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus my name, seeing it is secret? <clears throat> now the better part of what, what, what's in these verses is... Um, uh, in the verses that we haven't read yet, but I want to cover these, this 
first portion. And um, so we begin with the fact that <clears throat> here's another barren woman. And you go through the scriptures and you find that all the patriarchs' wives were, were barren. And, and all, all the way through, you just keep finding this. It's just over and over and over. I think it's more prevalent than most people realize. You know, Samuel's mom was that. Samson's mom was that. On and on and on. This thing of being barren. <clears throat> and uh, in the case of uh, Manoah's wife, she's barren. Everybody knows it. They, the thing about it is they don't even mention her name. Now, I will say this in advance. The husband, Manoah, seems out of touch with really what's going on. He's trying to get in, but he's not. So therefore, the messenger keeps coming to her, and then he has to come to her and then get the message. And, um, but she is in tune because she's the one that's barren. And the message is for her, but it's for them. But it pertains mainly to her. And so, um, you know, like I said, no, it doesn't even mention her name. Nobody knows her name. Well, guess what? God knows her name. God knows her name. And out of all of these people and all of this going on where they've left the Lord and everything, God knows her name. Okay. And she's hungry. She's hungry. I, I, I heard these words the other day, a hungry womb. But it's talking about bringing forth Christ. It's talking about more than just a historical story uh, that's, that's telling us a, a good news story for somebody thousands of years ago. It's, not, it's so much more than that. It is God declaring his son. It is God wanting his son, not just in heaven, not just in the midst of us in a gathering, but God wants his son in us, and he wants it really, really bad. He, cre he created us to have another life, the life of Christ within us. Uh, that's, that's an amazing reality when you think about it. That he created us to be able to have another life within us. That we're empty like we're barren until Jesus comes in. And then he brings this forth. Brings this forth. So she believes God. She believes God. And she wants him in. She wants this son. She wants what God wants. She wants why God visited. She wants to bring forth a son that would bring honor to the father. <clears throat> so in verse 3, we get, uh, we get God's agenda there. And the angel of the Lord appeared and said unto the woman, Behold, now thou art barren and bearest not. It seems like Seems like, you know, you could have just said it once, you know. I mean, you know, are you trying to make me feel worse, you know? You're barren and you're not bearing. Okay, well, I would have got that in the first one. But nonetheless, but thou, here's the good news. But thou shalt conceive a son, the son, the son in us, the lamb dwelling in us, that lamb son that is meant to be the life of the church, that's meant to be the mind of the church, that's meant to be the heart of the church, not some external religious object or something far away, but dwelling in his people, dwelling in his temple, which we now are. So I wrote that before anything else happens in this story, we find God's agenda. God wants his son out of us. God wants his son out of us. So the angel appears with that message. And, and he appears, he appears to one who is barren, lest we claim that all of the good stuff that comes out of us is us, or we're special, therefore we're specially anointed instead of being out of the way and empty so that Christ can fill us. 
so that in our weakness he can be our strength so that so that in all of these things he would get all the glory we say well i want jesus to have the glory but do you want him to have all the glory well then it's a blessing to start off barren it's a blessing it's a blessing in that way then you know this anything comes out of you that's of that seed that's him and it's not that glory is not to go to me. Uh, back in ver- I just want to mention something back in verse 1. Verse 1 said this, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. So what's the, what's the condition of the people at this time? What are the, what's the condition of the world, if you will, God's world, God's people? They're doing evil. And, you know, uh, let me just read this. They are doing evil again. (laughs) Again. So God does not come to bring devices that will stop the sin in them. He comes to bring the sun. And and as we shall see, uh, he's going to bring the sun in the flames. In this story, we just didn't read that yet. So God's answer for deliverance is that he be the deliverance, that Jesus be the deliverance. In other words, um, you think about uh, Jesus when he came in to cleanse the temple. So we're supposed to be the temple. So Jesus doesn't walk up to the temple and go, okay, you know, you know, be, be whole, be blessed, be this or that. No, he comes in and he starts cleaning out all of our fake lambs and all of our offerings that are not him and all of that. He drives it all out. The zeal of the Lord's house hath, hath gotten hold of me. And that, that should be the voice that we hear inside of us, because um, we're the temple of God. Our bodies are the temple of God. The church is the temple of God. That should be the voice that we hear inside of us. That the zeal of the Lord wants to drive. And see, see, he, how did it, how did it get cleansed? Jesus came in. Jesus came in. He didn't stand on the outside and cast it out. When it comes to his temple, his habitation, he comes in and it's going. But if we keep going, you know, looking up somewhere far away and going, oh, Lord, you know, get this stuff out of me. He's going, that's not the way I work. Not in my temple. I want to come in. I want to be, I want, you know, because, you know, he... He didn't leave any loose things in there that were negative. He drove it all out. And that's what he wants to do in us. Can we believe for that? I mean, can we all believe for that? Father, we just ask you to quicken those scriptures to us. We ask you to do do more than quicken the scriptures to us of Jesus cleansing the temple but make it spirit and life and make us realize every moment of every day we are the temple that you have come to live in and we want to quit playing with the stuff we had in there before Jesus was there and we want him to go ahead and cleanse out our temple. In Jesus' name, Father. Verse 4. Um. Now, therefore, beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine, nor strong drink, or eat not any unclean thing. So this, this really, this is part, this is part that really got me. <laughs> God is expressing his heart and his concern for his son in us. He's going, I, I want to order the life of this child. I want to, I'm the father. See, I'm the father and the son that we have in us. 
He's the father of that son, and he's talking to us. He's talking to Manoah's wife. He's saying, look, there's certain things I don't want you doing that's going to mess with the life of my son or putting in you. So let me just read these, these notes. The concern from God and the warning given to her was that he will be inside of you, so be careful what you feed him. It is possible to put things in you that will negatively affect the seed within. The same with the parable of the sower. The seed is put inside the ground, us. But though it is the seed, it is affected in terms of how much fruit or how effective it will become based on what else you have allowed in you that is not meant for his growth. I mean, if we could... You know, if we could not be religious, just if we could just wipe out all religious thoughts of everything and just look at this like there's a real father, there's a real God, and, and he put the real son in us, and his concern isn't our little lives and all the little things that we do down here except as it relates to his son, and he wants us to be like a, it's kind of weird. I'll just say it like this. I didn't think of it like that before, but I, right now, he wants to be a, kind of like a, a, you know, a wife or something that is going to bring up his seed right. We're going to be a good wife to the father, and we're going to bring up his seed right. You know? And I really, when I was reading this, I was so deeply affected because... I, I saw the magnitude of, of, of uh, the influence of things in our lives that maybe regularly um, are stunting his growth, if you will. I know that's a silly way to put it, but that are making him sickly. Or, and I know, again, but I'm trying to just give some examples here. <laughs> work with me. Uh, and if we took that to heart that said God like Manoah's wife came to me and put his seed in me and he wants me God wants me to take care of his son and God wants me to feed him correctly and not eat anything that would get in the milk that I've breastfeed to him or whatever. What a, what a, I mean, what a responsibility, but what a glorious calling. I mean, that's better than ministry, if you will, if you understand what I mean. It's better than raising up a church or going to the mission field or whatever. This is, this is the ministry to the Father in relationship to how we treat his son within us. And you know the, you know the gatherings. The gatherings aren't about us shaping up or this or that it's the son it's it's about the son we we want the father to get the son of his love that's what it's called in colossians the son of the father's love oh and, and what if when it's all said and done we stand before god and he goes you know and and we're going okay yeah go ahead you know i see you on the throne God, you know, I see you on the throne, Father. Go ahead and read off all my failures uh, that, you know, I didn't go to church a lot or I did this or that or that bad thing that I did. And he said, well, I don't want to talk about that. That's not the works or the things that I was most concerned about. Remember when you were always eating this garbage and you were okay with it and how it it was affecting the fact that your son wanted to come forth. My, you know, his son wanted to come forth and wanted to bring forth glory to God and wanted to live. You know, I must, I can hear Jesus crying out inside of us. I must be about my father's business. I must be that. I, I am that, so I must be that. And... I don't know. I, I just saw this beyond the sermon. I mean, I saw it so incredibly real 
that what if the father, the only areas he, he, he wasn't worried about sin because Jesus died on the cross for all that sin. He was worried about how we treated his son. He was worried about if we kept putting stuff in us that we liked, but it was not good for his son. And I'm not, I, again, I'm not even talking about sin. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just saying, using this story. It, you know, Father, may your spirit that came upon her, oh, and upon me, and what you had in mind, come upon all of us. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. Father, in Jesus' name. So, um, so the message from God to the parents is, and I just made a little one, two, three, four. Number one, you're going to get the seed, not merely a child. You're not going to just get a child. You're not going to just get, have a be a happy couple. Oh, it's a husband and wife, and we got a child. And we'll raise him for the Lord, but God put his seed in us, his son. Number two, your barrenness is over. Good message. That's a good message right there. Number three, my presence is here toward that end. That's confirmation. Number four, now make him your main care and focus. <laughs> so I put in verse three and four, the care and feeding of the seed dealt with him on the inside. See, a lot of our uh, Christianity is focused outside of us. It's, it's focused in maybe a church meeting. It's focused maybe in, in if we're at work and having a hard time, we look to the God of the heavens or, or that. There's, for many, many Christians, there's little, little attention given to the care and feeding of the seed on the inside. And that's just, you know, I mean, we can, we can hear this message and feel condemnation. I didn't feel condemnation. I felt the love of the Father for His Son, and I wanted to respond the way He wanted me to. I know she did. Yeah. She did. You know, she didn't say, this is too much responsibility, I can't do this. You know, <laughs> it's like, okay. There's some things I'm going to have to not eat now. Gosh, you know, I'm going to have to give up wine. Okay. Slow down there, Randy. Verse 5. <clears throat> For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor. So he starts talking all the things he says in verse 5 is basically summed up in saying he belongs to the Lord. He belongs to the Father. Everything I'm asking you to do, I'm asking you as a father, that's my son. I'm asking you. I'm privileging you with my son. Now I'm asking you to be with me, and let's just flow together. Let's just flow together. I don't believe it was a message of condemnation. I believe it was a glorious message, and I believe that somehow, because see, all of the, you know, there's everybody's evil. I mean, basically, the way the story sounds from verse 1, except her, he comes to her, and he doesn't go to her husband because he's out of tune also, but he keeps showing up to her, and she literally has to go get him, you know. Um, so, but verse 5 does say stuff like this. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarene unto God from the womb. <laughs> Isn't that something? From the womb? Meaning he's already that, and he's, you're going to help him along the way. Because from the womb is up from the inside. But verse 5 is now talking about what I want you to do on the outside. So it's a transition here that we've just gotten into. Uh, verse 5 now deals with the care on the outside. The emphasis was on the fact that he belonged to the Lord and you must not remove or cut hair off anything uh, from your outward Jesus that takes him away from God's purpose and plan. Your Jesus meaning 
Christ in you, the hope of glory. Anything, I'm going to say, read this one again. The emphasis was on the fact that he belongs to the Lord or the Father. And you must not remove, meaning cut off, you must not remove or cut off anything from your outward Jesus that takes him away from God's purpose or his Father's purpose and plan. In other words, your outward son must match what the heart of God wants him to look like and don't work on conforming him to your family or to other kids of his age. <laughs> okay. I mean, this is God. This is, he's already said, I'm going to do, I'm going to put the right one in you. You're going to get the right seed. But for, for nine months, I want you to make sure that you don't put anything in there. And then he says, and now let's talk about when he comes out. Here's what I, here's the way I want him to appear to appear. There's a lot to be said about a Nazarite that I won't get into, but that's, it's a really wonderful area. Uh, so, um, finish off what I was reading. He, he will be strong and able to defeat, because you, you do know who, he, who this son's going to be, don't you? <laughs> Samson. Okay. Samson. All right. He will be strong and able to defeat all enemies as the individual circumstances arise. But be sure and feed him on the altar for the place of being in the fire and losing is where the victory will eventually come. Hallelujah. And the way this story ends, and I didn't even read those scriptures yet. The way this story ends in this chapter, oh, it's all about the fire. And it's all a picture of this son that's going to go into the fire and be with God in the end. In the flames. All right. So, verse 6 and 7. Um, in verse 6 and 7, <clears throat> right now, um, it's just a message to them. She hadn't, the seed's not put in her yet. They hadn't figured it out. They've just been given a message. And you know how that goes. I mean, we can focus on the message all day long. And there are Christians, even Christians that you probably know, that might even embrace um, the reality of Christ in you, but they've embraced the message harder and stronger than they have the Christ that is in them to release life, to release him, to feed him, to, to, to do all that we can that it may be Christ, you know, I mean, it, again, Galatians 2.20, not I, not I, not I, not me, not me, but Christ in me. Not just not me, but Christ, not me, but Christ in me. And to not espouse the message but espouse the, the living reality, the living reality, and wanting to always, 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 as much as in me is, to line up with the Father's desire for his Son. See, it's not... Father, give me your son for me and all the benefits that can come to me and all the help that can come to me and all of the, you know, uh, 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 and all of the gifts that can come to me and all of the ministries you can open to me for me and all of this. But Father, Father, that you may receive your son out of this vessel and I don't care ultimately about the other things, if I could just have that happen, like the end of this chapter, where he would rise to you in the flame. <clears throat> he 
in verse 6, she goes and tells her husband the particulars of the encounter. In verse 7, she reports the word concerning the son coming forth and, and what he will be to God. I love that. She goes and says, here's what he's going to be to God. Is he going to be a believer like us? No, no, that's not what God wanted. He's going to be something different. <laughs> I almost said, I'm only joking, but I'm, and I wasn't planning on saying, he's going to have long hair. <laughs> well, Jesus, I think, did have long hair. I don't think he had a crew cut. But anyway, that's... Um, so Manoah is like, well, I want to hear it. But he's still seeking the message. She, she came to him. She heard it. The messenger spoke directly to her. She got up, ran to her husband, said, the, here's the message, and it came from a messenger from God. But it's not a message. We're going to have the sun come forth out of us. And he goes, well, you know, can I talk to that guy? <laughs> I'd like to talk with him. Okay, well, uh, after hearing that Manoah, uh, so Manoah prays, you know, when he finally gets there. And after hearing that Manoah prays and asks God to appear again to teach them how to raise him up in accord with God's plan, he clearly assumed that they were not to raise the son according to, to the way everyone else raises theirs. That's what Manoah heard. He would be God's. He would be only God's. And by carefully following the Father's instruction will be the Son that will turn out to be what the Father envisioned in us. That's called joy. For joy that a, that a son is brought forth. Right? Jesus talked about that. For joy that the seed is brought forth, that the son is brought forth. Not just that we worship the son on the throne, but that we follow the father's guidelines for the very life that he put within us. And we make that the priority. All right. So in verse 9-11, 9-11, I remember writing that down and going, uh-oh. Verses 9 through 11, um, <clears throat> the angel comes back and again appears to her when the husband's not there. And it's like, my husband asked to meet with you, but you've appeared to me again. Well, go tell your husband. I'll be waiting right here. I'm right here where you are because you're the one going to bring forth. You're the one that's de dedicating your, your whole being to this seed. And you go get him and we'll fill him in on the particulars. You, we'll see later on. I don't know. Probably not this go around. But we'll see. Manoah is a little bit dense. He really is. He kind of doesn't get it a lot. He's like, what? You know? God, son, I don't know. You know, and he really has to be dealt with. Um, is that, can I have a tissue? It's here somewhere. I know I can feel this, the presence of the tissues. There. I still have the residue of whatever I was dealing with, as well as I keep tearing up over certain things. Um, so Manoah comes and he asks to hear the message and uh, and is wanting at least to know I do need to hear specifically what you would want me and how you would want me to order the life of the son that you're going to put in, my, uh, in me. 
in us. And that was good. That was good. Praise God. All right. So, so Manoah comes and he hears and he's in agreement with the message. Now, can you, again, can you agree with me that there is a difference of heart of being in agreement with the message as opposed to being in agreement with the son that the father wants and our responsibility to, to feed, care for him in a certain way. I mean, there's just a big difference. There's just a big difference between that. And I, part of the reason why I'm making, I'm, I'm stressing some of that is because I know that this reality of the son in us, that the father He's the father of that son, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And, and I know that there's a big old portion of his heart that is dedicated to this desire for, for every one of us that has the son within it. So... Um, so in verse 13 through 14, he re reiterates the um, things to Manoah. So, that kind of, so it all of a sudden starts changing. <laughs> the, the Manoah, again, kind of goes off the rails. And um, at verse 15, let's read 15 and 16. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. First of all, detain him. I, isn't he going to go see to it that the, that the seed's, you know, in her? Going to detain her and hang out and have coffee or something? <clears throat> and, but then he says, until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. Okay, that's a, a, a goat, a baby goat. <clears throat> or not a baby, but a younger goat. <clears throat> Verse 16, And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. Okay, so I put somewhere in my notes that there's, that the way that Manoah said that could possibly be, I'd like for you to stay, we'll have a meal, we'll do barbecue. <laughs> Just hang out for a while. Or it could mean uh, an offering, yeah. okay? Um, and that's verse 16. The angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. So I'm taking care of the meal by saying that is what he's doing. And then he says, And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. So he's saying, Now, if this is going to get to the situation of being an offering, then you offer that to the Lord. And then it says, for Noah and Manoah, Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. Remember his wife originally said that. She didn't think it was an angel. She said, there's this guy. This guy showed up. He was really, had a really good facial, you know, structure and he kind of had a glow about him. It's like, okay. But Manoah, really says a whole lot in here where he misses the point. <clears throat> so I wrote, and, and I'm sorry for reading so much, but in this sense, I really did not, I was down for the count in the bed for days and days and days, weeks. And um, so I'm, I'm just blessed that the Lord spoke to me at all. <clears throat> so... Um, it is at this point that Manoah changes the subject. From what? The seed. Um, he wants to show Christian hospitality now. This will be a blessing to this guy. Because he still thinks he's just a guy. The angel knows that Manoah's offer to feed him something could either be meant to be a meal or, you know, would be uh, offering to God something. The angel points out that if it is an offering he's talking about, then that must be offered to the Lord and not to him. 
from what was uh, in that verse, it appears that Manoah didn't know that the messenger was any more than just a man, and because of that was only offering him a meal. Right? All right. So in verse 17 and 18, he, he goes, oh, okay, do us a favor. Tell us, um, tell us what your name is. Because once we have this kid, we want to tell, we want to give the credit to you. We want to tell everybody, you know, so about, you know, whatever your name is. And he's going, yeah, I, I can't tell you my name. It's secret or, or it's not meant to be known by you because it's not about me right now. It's about the father and the son. This could be a messenger. See, the word angel means messenger. And this could be any one of us that are talking about a precious relationship between the father and the son. But we're only messengers. We're only speakers. We're only whatever. This is not really... If this is, you know, you, Randy, carry this message forth. But when it's all said and done, the messenger is gone, and the father and the son are still what it's about. Yeah. And that the father get the son from out of us. And then uh, verse 19. So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what that means, but it just thrills me. Uh, and Manoah and his wife looked on. So obviously at this point, it, it, Manoah's caught on that uh, this is more than a dinner they're going to have, and this is, a, this is of God. <clears throat> and then verse 20 and 21, and for it came to pass when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. And Manoah and his wife looked on and fell on their faces to the ground. But the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. All right. So we have no record of the flame on the goat. He mentioned that he would offer it, but there's no record of the flame on the goat, nor is there any record of the, the kid, the goat, going up in the flame. Nor a sweet fragrance from the kid. Number one, it was the flame that went up. It was the flame that went up. The altar will remain on the earth, but the fire is God's special tool. It is his vehicle to bring what is of him out of the earth and back to him. It's called Book of First Peter. So instead of Manoah's offering, <clears throat> it was the messenger that ascended up in the flame. Hmm. Hmm, I would say, how wonderful. You know, I would say, this is great. <laughs> the messenger's work is done and no longer needs to be seen. He has been with the Lord in the fire. His fellowship was in them, the father and the son. It had nothing to do with Manoah's offering of a kid, but everything to do with what God offered through his messenger. And then verses 22 and 23, and that's the end of the chapter. And Manoah said unto his wife, this is the man saying to the woman, we shall surely die. Uh -huh. 
And the wife turned to him and said, is that all you got out of this? <laughs> no, that's not in the scripture. We shall surely die. Ah, but wait till you hear what she said. Amen. <clears throat> Verse 23, but his wife said unto him, if the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would, we, he would not have received a burnt offering and a meat offering at our hands Neither would he have showed us all these things, nor would as at this time have told us such things as this. <clears throat> this, is a, this is a wife that is just incredibly in tune. She's going, look, why is he going to kill us? You know, well, you know, you know the, the scripture that says no man has seen God and lived. Okay, so that, that spread all over the place and, you know, and. And so everybody's afraid, you know, I don't want to see God, you know. She's going, look, the very fact that he received this up in a flame means that he received it from our hands. He received this from us. We gave him a fire and a, you know, offering, and he put his messenger in there, the messenger, the message of the Father and the Son and their wonderful relation. I do always those, please that th please, those things which please my Father, Jesus said. I do always. Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. She said, um, <clears throat> he would not have received a burnt offering at, a, at our hands. Neither would he have showed us all these things about the son and about him wanting to put a son in us and about him wanting us to do it a certain way and all of this. He would not have come here and told us all that if he wants to kill us. He wants us to live in accord with his heart and his son. With his heart and with his son. This is, this is the desire. <clears throat> now, I haven't even got to my notes yet. What time did I start? Or how much time left? <laughs> I think we're on 49 minutes. It's 1055. All right, I've been going 49 minutes. God forbid that I not hit an hour. <laughs> but now I can just really concentrate on just reading some things. So in this last part, there's two views of the altar. This is important now because we're talking about being with him in the altar and in the fire, in the flame. Two views. You, you, if you're not careful, you're going to take Manoah's view. Or are you going to take her view of this? I mean... Some of you wives, have you ever noticed how, you know, your husbands sometimes are just out of tune? I'm kidding. I'm joking. Don't, don't kill me, guys. <laughs> I see Cassie on there, and she's, she's shaking her head. You, you weren't shaking yes. You're going, no, he's never out of tune. Nor you or me. All right. So two views of the altar fire. Manoah's view, first of all. Seeing God in the fire will kill us. That's his view. Okay, well, that's, that ain't it. He's not trying to kill you. He's trying to bring forth his son. And, and, and so, uh, so the second part of Manoah's view is the fire will kill us. And then the third part, being with him here at, in the altar and in the fire is not good. This is, this is what he got out of that whole story. All right, um, and then I put, he is afraid of what he doesn't understand. He thinks the worst. He misreads the fire. He only connects the present subject as a personal event for them, him, and how it will affect them instead of an eternal event of God wanting his son and will do everything in his power and by his spirit to help you and I to grow in that image and to bring forth that son he's committed he's in 
He's in. If we can only see how powerfully that is true in him. And then... Uh, Uh, he, and he left out, God wants us to be with him for seed, and he wants it to start in the fire. All right, so here's the wife's view. The fire is for our benefit. It doesn't mean rejection, but acceptance. The fire's not our enemy, but proves acceptance. It proves acceptance. The fire proves that we're accepted. What's going on with the fire and the altar is not about personal examination, but it's about how he wants to bring forth the seed. She is not worried, but she is all in. All right. And then just this little bitty part about Samson, their son, as he grows. Samson made a lot of mistakes, did a lot of things wrong, but he ultimately learned and I don't have time to preach that whole sermon but <clears throat> so once Samson is born and gone through maturity meaning come to the place where he's ready to be given um, his victory will be similar to his parents in the fire as to how he handles the fire okay so he could be there, the Philistines are rejoicing and got him as a captive. He looks defeated. Jesus looked defeated. Jesus was on the cross. Jesus was mocked and everything else, and I'm sure Samson was. And his eyes were put out, but his, probably the best thing happened to him was his eyes were put out so that his heart can come forth. And in that, his his victory is similar to his parents in that if you, I don't even know if I read the last part about how the flame, what, yeah, that, that, that he went up in the flame, that he has heard the stories from his parents from a little boy of what happened and the, the high point of it was that this whole thing went up in a flame and brought glory to God and was acceptance. And maybe the Spirit of God hit him and said, it's not about strength, it's not about power, it's not about you're killing the enemy and overriding them and all this kind of stuff. It's about weakness, it's about lowliness, it's about allowing that nature to come forth and God will honor that seed, will honor that son, will honor that lamb nature, that lamb that's in us. And Samson says, just one more time, give me strength, but not strength to get loose and go whip them all, but to let it all come down on me to give yourself, to give yourself by a certain spirit even though there were no flames there, and, and God willing, next, next time I share, we'll get into an amazing reality about the truth of the flame and the altar. And so I'm not going to give it away right here, but it's acceptability in that flame. And it says, it says of Samson, he took down more of the Philistines in his death than in his life. And that's it. Jesus defeated. Jesus could walk this earth and use power and cast out demons and do this and heal that and help that person and feed that person and do all of that. But Jesus said, you know, at the end of his ministry, he said, except a seed fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, if it die, talking about himself, it'll bring forth much fruit. And so in his death, he did more than he did in his life because he defeated, he didn't just defeat some demons and people, he defeated the enemy. And the old nature and on and on. So let's... Whew, I'm weak. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Amen. So I'm going to turn it over to you after I pray.
Father, thank you so much for these hearts that love you and that want you and that seek you. Oh, I feel your heart for them all the time. I weep your tears for the love that I feel that you have for this people that we call Jesus tribe. Thank you for bringing us together, those who care from all over the world, literally. Those who care, Father, about your heart for your son, that that'll never stop, that'll never cease. That's eternal. That's eternal. And that giving kind of nature towards him and him towards you and the Holy Spirit towards your son and all how that God works, that's eternal life. And I just pray that you'll pour out your spirit upon us to not just attend or be uh, involved, but to be able I just feel like, in that sense, it's like Mary of Bethany and Jesus, we're your body at that time, and you're pouring oils upon us to soften us and prepare us. I just thank you so much that my heart can't even, it feels like it's bursting, and I can't even find the, the proper words. But I love you, and we love you, and we stand together, and we're no faster than the slowest sheep, and you're the good shepherd. So we're going we're gonna to press, we're going to continue, and we're going to ask that you bless all that we do in this gathering, and it'll bless our children, and it'll bless the, the workers, and we will all be risen up in that flame with you to your glory. In Jesus' name.